Good morning, church. Scripture says to enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Would you stand with us as we sing grateful to our King today? church family. Really glad that you're here. My name is Nick. I'm one of the pastors. If I haven't met you, would love to do so. If you are new or visiting, I just dropped it. One second. And we're back. Um, we have a Hey There card that you will find in the seat back in front of you. Would love if at some point during the service you filled that out. You can turn it into myself, one of the ushers. Um, we have an offering box in the lobby. You can drop it there. And we'd love to follow up with you this next week. Help get you connected to the life of our church. Well, at this point, would you turn to a neighbor, find somebody that looks friendly and especially good this morning, and say, good morning, we're so glad you're here.
Okay, everybody looks good this morning. Good to see everybody. Uh, well, you can find your seat. Again, so glad everybody's here. Just one verse I'm going to share. It's an encouraging verse. Uh, and I thought it would be a little bit of fun this morning if, if we participate. So your line, when I point to you, is going to be run. Okay, so we're all going to say it together. So I'm going to read it. And when I point to you and kind of give you the signal, you're going to say with exuberance and excitement and like you mean it, run. Even if you're not a runner, I was thinking about it this week, everybody at some point in their life believes in running. Ever needed to go to the bathroom really bad? You believed in running. Ever running a little late? You believed in running. So whether or not you would define yourself as a runner, we all run sometimes. So here we go. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all the saints who have gone before us, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us let us, Run. with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Would you pray with me, and we'll continue singing together. Lord, that's, that's what we want to do this morning. We want to look to you. We want to look to your word. We want to look to your son, his redemption for us, accomplished on the cross. Uh, throughout the weeks, we, we can tend to pick up weights. We can, we can add things to our lives, things that are maybe not of you or just things that are unnecessary to our walk with you that, that hinder our pursuit of you. And so this morning, would you refocus our hearts, our lives on you? Would you maybe show us areas where we've, we've added some weights, some things that are not helping us pursue you because we want to know you. you. You came to give life to the full and we want that. We want to love you more, love others better. Teach us, guide us in those ways this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, 
took me You breathed your life in me You've been so, so kind to me Oh, the overwhelming, ever-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights me Don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Ever-ending Reckless love
and to love us and to bring us into your family, God. That we would know your goodness. That we would know your promises, Lord. Lord, we worship a God with amazing, unfailing love. Lord, thank you for how you've transformed our hearts, God. Would you continue to do so, Lord? Would you have your way in us? As we study your word, Lord, would it transform us from the inside out? In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Isn't it great to belong to the household of God? Where because of our identity in Christ, it's true that our fears and our failures and our struggles, even our sins, no longer define us, but Jesus defines us. He gives us a new identity. I am so grateful for that. And it's all because of his love, which is so great that it can't be fully understood or measured or defined. And it's a love that we can even define. Some scholars define it as reckless, like we just sang, just because, as Paul prayed, there we We'll never know the height and depth and breadth and width of the love of God. So we hope that this morning is an amazing time of being immersed in those Jesus truths again, recognizing his presence, his love, his grace, his power, his invitations. My name is Brian, one of the pastors on staff here. If I uh, haven't met you, please come up and say hi. I know I look scary, but I'm really not that intimidating. If you come up, would love to say hi to you and get to know you. It is my privilege this, uh, this morning to introduce our speaker, Murray Greenwood. M Murray and Cheryl, come on up, Murray. Why don't you give Murray a hand? <laughs> Murray and Absolutely. Cheryl have been missionaries in Ecuador for how many years now? 16 years. 16 years. And Murray is a medical doctor, and they have been doing uh, work with a small church in the town of is it, how do you Loja. Pronounce? Loja. J is an H in Spanish, right? Loja. L-O-J-A. And uh, so they've been down there for 16 years. They're back on a home service visiting today. And Murray is going to be preaching for us. And I'm super excited about this because he was willing just to uh, also take the next section in our Ephesians series. Uh, so he's going to be in the first part of Ephesians 5. And I'm excited because he gets to bring some of his cross-cultural experience as we navigate this incredibly rich text. He loved me multiple times during the week for giving him 20 verses. <laughs> Actually, he, I don't think he loved having 20 verses, but it's such a rich, uh, rich text. So, it is. by the way, Murray and Cheryl will be sharing specifically more about their ministry in Ecuador right after church, about 11.45 in the fellowship hall. We'll even bribe you with lunch, but then they will be sharing about their ministry. So if you can, stick around for that. encourage you to do that. So let me pray for Murray and then turn it over to him. Lord, thank you for your grace in Murray and Cheryl's life and their call to ministry in Ecuador for the ways that you have provided for them, <clears throat> sustained them through uh, amazingly good times and undoubtedly many challenges along the way. Lord, I pray that you would refresh them in incredible ways during their months in the States, um, but I pray that you would strengthen them as well as they continue to oversee and carry on ministry with uh, people in Ecuador. And I pray for Murray now that you would bless him as he leads us through this text, lengthy as it is, Lord, I pray that you would help him to convey this with grace and truth and power and beauty. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, and to God be the glory. All right. Good morning. All right. Buckle your seatbelts. 
All hands and arms inside the cockpit, please. Okay. So, um, as an additional point, if you're not able to stay for the after, after church gathering, we do have some information in the back in the foyer. Look for that. You can sign up for newsletters if you're interested, and we'll see uh, how you feel after this sermon, <laughs> if you want to sign up for those or not. Okay, um, there we are. Okay, my wife Cheryl and I have been in Ecuador for the past 16 years, serving in the least reached region of this South American country where less than 2% in the city of Loja have saving faith in Jesus Christ. And less than 1 in 1,000 in the surrounding rural areas know the true Jesus who is revealed in the Scriptures. Now, please put your hands like this, all of you. Put your hands in front of your face, okay? You are looking at a topographical map of the country of Ecuador. Okay? Ecuador has the same land area as the state of Colorado. Colorado is a mountain state, right? So in Colorado, the lowest elevation is about 4,500 feet, and it goes up to the highest point in the 48 contiguous states, 14,500 feet approximately, um, in the state of Colorado. Now, of course, we have a slightly higher peak here in California, but you get the idea. Okay, now in Ecuador, you have sea level and the Galapagos Islands at zero, and you go to 21,000 feet, 7,000 feet higher than anything in the continental 40, 48 states, and down to 3,000 feet on the other side in the Amazon jungle. So you're talking about enormous biodiversity, and uh, you, know, you travel 45 minutes, you're in a different climate. We like to say there are no naturally occurring horizontal surfaces. We have the privilege of participating in what God is doing in Ecuador. And we like to use the phrase, be disciples who make disciples. We're going on to that next one. Be disciples who will make disciples who will make disciples. Because that is the idea, multiplication raising up laborers prepared. There are very few believers in Loja, and there are very few of those who have been a Christian for over 10 years or who have read very much of the Bible. So the most strategic way to reach the 98% is to invest in the 2%. We are involved in what God is doing in a huge variety of ministries, which we'll touch on a few, but every single thing we do is focused on helping others not only come to saving faith, we're not called to make converts, but to make disciples, followers of Jesus Christ, who will grow to maturity in Christ and develop the ministry skills to reach others, to reach and to teach. Okay? So every believer is called to reach out to others at some level. So we're multiplying laborers for God's harvest field. So here's a few quick examples. I meet regularly, one-on-one, um, -on -one, every week with this promising young doctor who came to Saving Faith about seven years ago. Now, like Jesus with the 12 disciples, we don't just talk about the Bible. You know, Jesus lived his life with them. So we talk about every aspect of everyday life and how faith intersects with life. Life on life, you know, it's real life, whole person, discipleship, and that is what I hope you will be doing with the people in your circle of influence. Okay, I'm deeply involved in the local Ecuadorian church. This is the men's group. And then we have the young adults class, which now the young people we've trained are leading that, co-leading it with me. I lead about a third of the time. And then for the past two years, I have been teaching God's word in church like this, uh, but not quite like this. <laughs> it's a little different setting. <laughs> about every other week, I get to preach the word of God in Spanish. So that takes some serious preparation, I can assure you. So these are actually pre-pandemic photos, I'm very honest here, but you know, I don't take a lot of photos of me actually doing ministry. We're too busy doing ministry to take pictures of it. Okay, and of course, as a part-time pediatrician, I see patients, there's the ah, 
and I get to do some medical teaching one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. Okay, my wife Cheryl is one of the most purpose-driven, consciously intentional people you have ever met. I can say without, without even knowing you, <laughs> she's one of the most intentional people I've ever known. She summarizes what we actually do as training trainers. For several years, Cheryl has been intensively coaching local believers in small groups and individually in applied biblical principles of personal financial management taken from the scriptures and training these believers to lead others through an excellent 14-week Bible study series with daily Bible reading assignments, establishing a new habit of daily personal Bible reading with extremely practical action steps. So we want to see disciples, genuine followers of Christ whose lives are being transformed by the gospel, which makes them an effective witness to others. When people see your life change, they want to know what happened. Why? What is going on? You are different. These last two photos are from one of the Healing Emotional Wounds of the Heart Bible study series that Cheryl co-leads, and she's also trained trainers. So these are some of the Ecuadorians that Cheryl has trained who are leading that series uh, with some other people. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more we could go on and on. But the point is, in everything we do, we're trying to raise up Ecuadorian believers to do the work of ministry. Partnering with them, come alongside someone. If we go sharing Christ, we're not just going sharing Christ. We're take along a local, is the slogan. So you are invited to stick around for the explanation afterwards, because we'll talk a bit more after church about all of this. Okay, now for the reading of the scripture. Now understand, this is the word of the Lord, okay? You got to be attentive to this, because unlike Pastor Brian, I don't have the gift of brevity. So if I'm going to cover today's text, I'm going to focus on some high points and you're going to have to catch a lot of the rest from the text itself when we read it right now, okay? So don't sleep. <laughs> Ready? Okay. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man, I guess the women get off? <laughs> no. <laughs> Who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light, the product, the result, the outcome, the fruit of the light is, consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper! And rise from the dead, 
and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine. Tequila's okay? Or any other substance, okay? For that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, the issue here is not, oh, when I'm filled with the Spirit, it's like being drunk. That's not it. It's what do you allow to control you? Be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. For when we give thanks, especially for the things we don't want or didn't wish for, that expresses trust. Okay, are you with me? Amen. I won't put the Bible on the floor. That will make Ecuadorians mad. Okay, we don't do that, dishonoring the word, no. We'll just use it, the script here. Okay, so we live in a soundbite world, do we not? Amen. All right, so here it is. Okay, everybody with me? I believe that verse 18, be filled with the Holy Spirit, which certainly means be filled with God the Holy Spirit, is the key to understanding the how of this passage. There are some hard-hitting commands in this passage, if we take them seriously. God calls us to live a supernatural life, a humanly impossible life. God's standard is high, but not too high for God. So verse 1 tells us to be imitators of God. Verse 2 tells us, be like Christ. Jesus Christ, God the Son, who lived his earthly life full of the Holy Spirit and did not sin. Verse 18 tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which is what Jesus did. So this is just one aspect of what it means to be like Christ or to be an imitator of of God. Now, I don't mean to minimize or deny the manifestations of the Holy Spirit today, but I can tell you this. Most of the time, Jesus did not walk around speaking in tongues. So when it says he was full of the Spirit, what it means is that he was 100% yielded to God's will, to God's leading, God's direction through the Holy Spirit, affecting what came out of his mouth in everyday conversation, affecting his earthly behavior, his outward behavior. So if we are to be like Christ, we must be full of the Holy Spirit, yielding up our will to God's will, allowing God to rule We don't like kings in America. When you have a boss, you have a king who rules, who wants to rule over your choices and your life, your decisions. And if we are allowing him to fill us, then he is we are allowing him to empower us. It's not our strength, but the power of God working through us to do the impossible, folks. It's impossible to do what this passage demands apart from the Holy Spirit. And I want you to zoom in on verse 16. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. There was never a more strategic, intentional, purpose-driven person than Jesus Christ. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. If our purpose in life is to be like Christ, 
we'll have to care about what he cared about. If we are to be imitators of God, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, then we must be strategic in how we invest our time and in what we prioritize. We are to be strategic in living our lives in such a way as to be effective in reaching the lost around us. So there you have it in a nutshell, okay? I think I may have forgotten I'm supposed to be advancing slides. Let's see. There we go. Okay, we're looking good. All right. So, three times in this passage, Paul starts another section with the word walk. Okay? I'm giving you a rough outline of the passage, not of the sermon. Okay? Of the passage. Walk in love. Walk in the light, bearing the fruit of the light. And walk wisely, making the most of your time. I want to challenge you to use the note-taking space that you've got, okay? What is God saying to you? Not what am I saying to you. What is God saying to you today? What does he want you to change? What does he want you to do? How is your life going to be different because you were here today? Because you confronted this section of the word of God Now, to frame this whole sermon, it's very important that you understand what Brian has already alluded to. This book of Ephesians is written to believers. The book of Ephesians is written to believers who've already made a decision to place their trust in Jesus Christ alone. The earlier chapters of Ephesians explain our new identity in Christ as believers in Jesus. Saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, right? Chapters 4 through 6 now give us the therefore, the what should I do now that I'm saved, that results from that new identity in Christ. The whole passage in Ephesians 5 depends upon the fact of who you are in Christ, your new identity as a child of God in Christ. So if you happen to be visiting today for the first time or have any question about how to get saved or how you get a ticket to heaven, right? I want you to listen later, please, to Pastor Rob Miller's message, The Gospel Truth, which you can scan right there. It was posted on 9-11, or preached on 9-11. It makes it easy to remember. September 11th on the CMB Church website, if you don't get this QR code thing. We don't even know what QR codes are in Ecuador. Okay. Verse 1. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. I love this. The New International Reader's Version, 1998, translates it like this. You are the children God dearly loves. You are the children God dearly loves. So be just like him. Don't you love that? That is fun. Phillips, J.B. Phillips. As children copy their fathers, you, as God's children, are to copy him. Those are great translations. I love it. Now, the main thing I want to point out about this command is this. <laughs> if we are to be imitators of God, we have to know God. Twice more in this passage, in verse 10, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And verse 17, so then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We are commanded to do things that can only happen if we regularly immerse ourselves in the word of God. You can't obey God if you don't know what he says. You can't imitate God if you don't know what he's like. 
You can't just make him up. It's not God in our image. You understand? So you must prioritize, okay? This may be a call to action for you. You must prioritize regular daily time in God's word. Cheryl and I have never seen anyone really grow spiritually until they start to read the Bible for themselves or hear it read aloud. There are plenty in Ecuador who are very much oral preferred. So maybe they hear it audio or whatever. But regular, personal, on your own time intake of the Word of God. There are no shortcuts to spiritual maturity. You got to do it. Okay, my seminary professor, Dr. Harold Honer, was truly an expert, okay? I am not. He is, he was, truly an expert on the original Greek text of the New Testament. Dr. Honer wrote a 900-page commentary on Ephesians. You will be relieved that I will not share with you everything that... Professor Honer has to say on the 70-plus pages he gives to today's text. But in verse 1, Dr. Honer writes, Paul uses the phrase to become rather than to be imitators of God. You are to develop continuously into imitators of God. Make this your habit. Verse 2 continues the thought, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. So if we are imitators of God, then we will walk in love just as Jesus did. Jack Reacher says, details are important. So in verse 2, it says, Jesus gave himself up. For us, okay? People in Latin America often see Jesus as a victim. The Roman Catholic Jesus is still hanging on the cross. On Easter morning in Loja, Ecuador, the town is dead. Nothing happening, streets deserted. But on Good Friday, there are reenactments of the trial, flogging carrying his cross through the streets with blood running down him, you know. Really, seriously, and the crucifixion. All of that's reenacted every year. Easter is nothing, but Good Friday's the big day. Women watch the procession like it's a big parade. You go into Macy's parade, you know, the big thing. And they are weeping openly, crying out, Pobrecito, pobrecito, poor little thing. Poor little thing. Latinos often feel they've been mistreated, with good reason if you study their history. And so this aspect of Jesus' sufferings and unjust treatment really touches their hearts. But they completely miss the biblical fact that Jesus did it on purpose. The injustices of the trial, torture, and crucifixion of Christ are not something that took him by surprise, They're the very reason he came in the first place. He wasn't a poor little thing. He was the master and Lord. John 18, 6. I am he. The soldiers fall down. Look up Matthew 26, 53. Twelve legions of angels. Jesus had the power to kill them all. But he was no victim. (laughs) No way. He chose the nails. And he did it. For you and for me. Yeah? Amen. Okay. So, therefore, it is no small thing to be told to walk in love just as Jesus loved. You get it? This is self-sacrifice. This is serious. Real love is other-focused. It's not, oh, I love the way you make me feel. That's not love, guys. It's other-focused. It seeks the best interests of the one who is loved. 
So walk in love, just as Christ loved, means setting aside what you want. Got to get home to watch that game. To care about what God cares about. To prioritize what God sees as priority. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Are you doing that? So in verses 1 and 2, we're commanded positively to walk in love the way Christ loved. But in verses 3 through 5, the, we see the negative side of that commandment, what it looks like when we don't walk in Christ-like love. Dr. Tom Constable writes, self-indulgence is the opposite of self-sacrifice. Verse 3, but immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you. Okay, now in today's language, it would be possible to misunderstand this verse. This is not, let's keep it a secret. Don't even talk about it. No, no, you can do it, but don't talk about it. No, it's not, let's keep it a secret. This is an old-fashioned literary way of saying, such sins must be so far away from you, they won't even be mentioned. They won't even come into your mind. The New Living Translation rightly captures the meaning when it translates, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed. Such sins have no place among God's people. There shouldn't even be a hint of such things. Immorality. The Greek word, (laughs) I probably will say it wrong, porneia, yeah? Yeah? And obviously, there's etymological word origin ties to our word pornography. But in its original historical and cultural context, this word in the Bible was used of any kind of aberrant sexual conduct, including sex outside of marriage, adultery, incest. In the New Testament, other versions like King James, for example, often translate fornication a word you'll never hear outside of church, I don't think, um, which Webster's Collegiate Dictionary defines as consensual sex between two persons who are not married to one another. God has not stuttered, and God has not changed. Just because it is now culturally normal, geez, every TV show, right? Everything. Um, is culturally normal for two people who feel attracted towards one another to have sex. That doesn't make it right. In Matthew 5, 28, Jesus made it very clear that God's standard extends not only to our actions, but also to the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. He says, Jesus said, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So it's very clear the scriptures prohibit the use of pornography and the associated lustful thoughts that go with it. And just a word about scripture interpretation. When it says, he who looks upon a woman to lust for her, it doesn't mean to exclude other genders. God is calling all of us to a level of sexual purity that is radically countercultural. So verse 5, for this you know with certainty, no doubt about it, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Wow. In the parallel passage in Colossians 3, 5, it reads greed, which amounts to idolatry. Greed which amounts to idolatry. Does that strike you? I mean, you may escape the immorality thing, but how about the greed? I mean, geez, I didn't get this belly by eating less than I need. I hope you realize you can covet almost anything. You can be greedy for almost anything. Their lane is moving faster than mine. On the highway, you understand. Food, entertainment, golf clubs, their car, their anything. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. You know, everything. Their looks, their shape, their talent, 
the public recognition, the appreciation they receive for what they do. How come they got the spotlight? How come they mentioned them and not me? I work just as hard as them in the church. (laughs) We can sin in church, guys. Did you know that? If these verses do not strike you deep down with conviction, I wonder about your honesty. Okay, we got another sin to look at. So verse 5, I mean, this is serious stuff. No inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Harold Honer, the professor I mentioned, he writes, in verses 3 through 5, Paul listed vices characteristic of unbelievers, which consequently exclude them from the kingdom of God. He is saying a genuine believer cannot and will not practice such sins, and that people who do are not truly saved. Now, on this detail, I could be wrong. I acknowledge, I don't pretend to know everything. God is going to be the one who makes the decisions, right? But I disagree with Dr. Honer on this point. My seminary professor, Dr. Tom Constable, or Thomas Constable, was chairman of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary for many years. And he writes, interpreters who take this verse as evidence that a truly saved person cannot and will not practice these vices overlook the fact that some genuine believers live carnal lives. And he cites 1 Corinthians chapter 3, which I encourage you to read later. Okay? My own experience, I have seen seminary professors, pastors, godly leaders on all levels wreck their lives, destroy their ministries. Good people, folks, that I know love the Lord. And they have destroyed themselves through sexual sin. Many scholars say, well, this refers to people who regularly practice such sins. But that is exactly not what the passage says. There must not be a hint of such things among believers. And how do you quantify how much is practicing sin? Oh, the guy who only looks at pornography twice a year, he's okay. But the one who yields every month, he's out of there. You know? Oh, it was only one night. I only committed adultery once. It's not my habit. That doesn't make it okay, you know? Do you think God is saying there's an acceptable level of greed and covetousness? No. I think it's a serious warning. I see this verse as potentially applying to believers, you and me. It is a genuine warning to you and to me of the very real, very serious loss of eternal rewards. You forfeit your inheritance in the kingdom, which is no small thing. We can often go, oh, well, then I'm good. I'm, I get in. No, eternal is a long, long time. This is a big loss. And the book of Ephesians, written to believers, seriously warns believers against sin, falling into sinful habits that will do us harm. And we're warned about it because there's a risk we could actually do it. Remember, there is a reward for obedience. Jesus calls us to be disciples, not converts. Followers, obedient to him. There is a reward for obeying him. And the scriptures in John 14, 21 say obedience is the key to knowing God, essentially. He says, those who obey me, I will reveal myself to them. The idea of eternal rewards is a recurring theme in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 3 is a classic passage, but even this morning we cited Hebrews 12.1. Look at Hebrews 11 and Hebrews 12, and you see that these people were looking to the reward. The saints of the past. It pays to obey God, and when we disobey God, we forfeit our inheritance in heaven, and we will suffer serious consequences here on earth. Do not be deceived, folks. 
Verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes. J.B. Phillips translates it, don't let anyone fool you on this point, however plausible his argument. This verse warns against rationalizing these sins at any level and affirms that God's wrath falls upon those who disobey. Okay, some nitpicking person will say, but it says it falls on the sons of disobedience. Those are not us, the, so, the saved people. But verse 7 exhorts you not to be partakers with them. So you can't get out of it that way. If somebody's going to get struck by lightning, you don't want to be holding their hand. As a doctor, <laughs> you'll be glad I don't have a slideshow on this point. <laughs> STDs. I can tell you with authority that sexual sin leads to horrible consequences in this life. And the things that I have seen and the stories I could tell will make you cringe and crawl under your chairs. And that is to say nothing of the heartbreak, financial disaster that comes with divorces. I mean, jeez. Destroyed relationships, murders that are committed because of sexual sin. I mean, the consequences are devastating. If it weren't for the grace of God, none of us would have a hope. Amen? This is serious stuff. But regardless of the details of how you interpret it, the action point is the same. What is the action point? God's command to us is a call to absolute, uncompromising sexual purity at all levels, body, mind, soul, and spirit. Greed, foul language, everything. It's just, these are really high demands. And we need to take it seriously and get help. If you need help, get it. Don't hide it under the rug anymore. In Ecuador, for several years, Cheryl led selected young people. She'd had it up to here with the rank and file. So she goes, this one shows potential. This one shows potential. And she gathered a group of young people with potential for future leadership and did a drama discipleship group with them. They studied segments of the Bible and basically reenacted the Bible stories in order, chronological Bible storying, which they could present then to people who know nothing about the Bible. So again, we're doing ministry at multiple levels. You have those who know nothing who are receiving ministry from those who are learning as they're being discipled and trained. Yeah? That's good. Okay, so I met weekly with the young men from that group while she would meet with the girls, and we would talk brutal, honest accountability about everything. What have you been reading in the Bible? Yeah, but that's not all we talked about. These guys had never had anybody be that honest, that vulnerable, and yet set such a high expectation, such a high standard for them for their daily behavior. You need that. Find another believer who takes God seriously and is willing to respect confidentiality, assuming you're not planning to murder somebody tomorrow, who you can talk with regularly for accountability. Talk about motivation. i got to tell him about that. This is a call to radical obedience. Oh, those were supposed to be shown earlier. Sorry, guys. That's uh, our little group. Now, notice these verses don't say anything about your inclinations or your sexual preference or the way you feel, okay? Did you notice that? God does not condemn feelings. What is prohibited are thoughts and behaviors. This is a call to radical obedience. It is to yield your will to God 100% and obey him. And what he says, and trust him to meet your needs. Because God's not against sex. You can have all the sex you want within the proper bounds. And as I said earlier, the only way any of this is possible is if we are filled by the Holy Spirit of God. 
Galatians 2.20. Life verses, man. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians 5.16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. No compromise, total obedience by God's power. Not by striving, oh, I'm trying to be good. That will never get you there. Now, I want to interrupt this sermon. We're not at the end of the sermon. I'm interrupting with prayer, okay? You know what sins you must confront in your own personal life. So in your heart, in silence, say along with me, Lord, I have yielded ground. I have yielded ground to the adversary in this area of my life, whichever it is. I have given Satan permission, and I have submitted myself to bondage again, a sin I can't control. Oh, Lord, I confess my sin to you. I am responsible for my choices, for my actions, for my thoughts. I am the one who's done this. I am responsible. I will not try to cast the blame on somebody else for the things I have thought or the things I have said or done. Lord, I confess my sin and I reject it. I do not want to live in bondage to this sin any longer. Lord, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ on the basis of what Jesus has done for me when he took my punishment and carried the weight of my sins on that cross. He suffered and dead, bled and died because of me. According to your promise in 1 John 1, 9, I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I yield the control of my life to you. And I ask you, Lord, to cancel the permission that I have given to Satan in this area of my life. Cancel his permission to tempt and torment me over this. In the name and by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, I declare to Satan and all demonic spirits, you have no right, you have no authority over me in this area. I am a child of God redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? I encourage you to study Neil Anderson's books, The Bondage Breaker, Seven Steps to Freedom, Dr. Marcus Warner's recent book, Dr. Marcus Warner, A Deeper Walk. He's going to have a lot to say about this whole area. There is hope. We in Ecuador are working with a lot of broken, fallen people who do not live up or have not lived up to this standard. But what we see is this. When people who have come to saving faith in Jesus Christ begin to read God's word, the Bible, and take it seriously, then they take spontaneous, deliberate action to obey the word of God. One recent convert met with me to study the Bible. Good stuff. Eventually, he joined another Bible study I was leading. We were going through the life of Christ. And then Cheryl and I went on home assignment for a year back in the States. When we returned to Loja, Ecuador, I found that this friend was now living with one of the women from the second Bible study, and she was pregnant with his child, unintended consequence of Bible study. <laughs> As a result of reading the Bible and growing deeper in the Lord, this couple got married on their own initiative. I didn't say a thing to him about that. I was like just trusting that the Lord, you know, I would continue to confront him with we need to obey the word of God, you know, and let the Lord speak to him. God uses <laughs> broken and redeemed people, that's for sure. So the woman's son, by a previous relationship, 
has blossomed under the influence of this growing Christian man. God is a redeemer, and he uses broken, redeemed people to reach broken people who need to be redeemed. God can use you. I don't know how many of you sit there and think, God could never use me. God can use you. You don't have to know everything. You just have to be able to share what God's done in your life and share what he's teaching you. Just be honest and open. Don't try to push it on people. Just be honest. You love the, you know, whatever your football team is. You don't hesitate to talk about that. Talk about what you love. Let's jump to verse 16 because we're making the most of our time. (laughs) Making the most of your time because the days are evil. Now we're in the third subdivision of this text that I've labeled walk wisely. Walking wisely constitutes making the most of our time. I personally love this rendering in the New American Standard. The point of the text, the original, is to snatch up every opportunity. Make the best use of the time. Redeem the time. Make the most of the time. Say the various translations. Or the most of every opportunity. God wants to use us as his instruments to reach the lost. And in the process, he will refine, remake, and reshape us so that we become more and more like Christ who intentionally gave his life so that we could be saved. Now, currently, you are using every minute of your time. You ever think of that? No matter what you're doing with it, you are using all your time. If you're going to add these new priorities to your life, something else has got to go. We often fool ourselves. One of, you know, Satan's tool is deceit. We fool ourselves to think we can just squeeze in a little more. You've got to decide what you're not going to do if you're going to start doing something as a consequence of the sermon you're hearing right now. Make those hard choices. Do a serious inventory. How is God calling you to use your life, to invest your time, And what major change is he calling you to? God is speaking to you. God calls us to absolute, wholehearted submission to his will. We can only do what God calls us to do if we're empowered by the filling of the Holy Spirit as children of God. Live according to your new identity in Christ. Missionary doctor Tom Hale wrote, All Christians, without exception, have been called to give their lives totally to Christ with no reservations. Wow. All Christians, without exception, have been called to give their lives totally to Christ with no reservations. All Christians are called equally to be disciples, to obey and follow Christ. And that is going to include obeying the Great Commission, which is given to every Christian. If you feel God tugging at your heart to serve him on the mission field, for example, please talk with me or Cheryl after the service or during the gathering after the church. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. You are to imitate Christ. We're going to have to step outside our comfort zone. This is not easy. A lot of the things that you see up there, these are not, you may think, oh, well, that comes easy for them. Guys, if you knew, I mean, for the first several years, we would wake up every morning and go, we got to speak in Spanish today. Help me, Lord. You know, we get, let me get out of bed. You know, let me have the courage to face the day. We're introverts. Would you believe that? I mean, yeah. This is not easy. Okay, I'll go become jello, you know, on the floor after I'm done here. <laughs> so step outside your comfort zone. 
Carve out time to invest in someone who doesn't know as much as you or hasn't had the opportunity. Maybe they don't have parents who love the Lord. Are you investing your life in someone else? Are you discipling someone now? Meeting with somebody who doesn't know the Lord or who doesn't know him as well as you? Have you sat down and thought about how God wants to use your talents, your skills, your personality, your life story, the wreckage of your past? Because sometimes that's what helps somebody else identify with you and realize that Jesus could really actually love them. He really does use broken people, folks. So what will radical obedience look like in your life? Amen? Okay. Oh, (laughs) time to pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we worship you. We rejoice in the love of Jesus Christ for us. You chose us of all people. And we are thankful for that, Lord. We rejoice in you. And we pray, O Lord our God, that you would use us And indeed, that you would be glorified through our lives, and that we would live in such a way that others will know you. Amen. Amen.
Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was part away The precious blood of Jesus Christ So oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was part away just to briefly mention as we close. In the lobby today is a live scam um, opportunity. So if you work with children or if you're on a ministry team here and you've not been fingerprinted, today is the day to do that. You could see Susan Chang uh, right out in the lobby. Please take care of that. Get that done. That is a requirement to be on a ministry team here. A couple of harvest things to mention. Next Sunday, we are having our Harvest Festival, our Trunk or Treat. It's from 3 to 6 p.m. It's a great opportunity, A, to bring kids. Um, your kids, grandkids, invite neighbor kids to come and be part of that. It's a way for us to serve uh, those from our community, and it's a super fun time, so do that. Um, we also need candy for that. And we need lots of candy. So you can bring candy next Sunday. You can bring candy during the week. Uh, but that is also a way to be involved in this. And please be praying for that. It's a significant outreach for us. And if you would like to be involved, you can see Darla Buckles as well. Another harvest event is, I think it's two weeks from today, November 5th and 6th. Greg Laurie is going to be doing the Harvest Crusade again at uh, Angel Stadium in Anaheim. Saturday and Sunday. It's a free event. Uh, in addition to a message from Greg Laurie, each evening they have Christian musicians, and it really is a fabulous event. If you would like to serve, you could see Dave Nelson about being involved in that. Or again, it's a great opportunity to go and just be blessed, edified yourself, or to invite somebody. We are to, as we heard this morning, make disciples. This is a great opportunity to invite somebody to a fabulous event, Anaheim Stadium, November 5th and 6th. Dave Nelson has lots of information outside on that. Lastly, but perhaps most importantly, we heard, a, a, again, a very serious message because God calls us to a standard. We've heard that he expects us to walk in a way of holiness. And he doesn't compromise on that because he can't compromise himself. Now, maybe you are here and you're feeling like, man, I'm really struggling with something along that line. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like, I'm more than struggling. I've actually succumbed. That last song is so important. Jesus paid for all of that. And he allows us to return and to confess and enter into his way of life. And when he gives these commands, it's not to be restrictive, a joy killer. It's like he's pointing us to life, fullness of life. And this is the way. 
But we have people who will be up front. We have people in back. If you would like to just come and talk and confess and pray, you can come. We would love to engage that prayerful conversation with you. Last reminder, 1145, we will begin in the fellowship hall. Murray and Cheryl will be um, presenting more of their ministry in Ecuador there. Would you stand and receive the benediction today from Colossians 3.15? Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. In Jesus' name, amen.